Welcome back. In this module, we'll be looking at several of the cultures that are precursors to our examination of the ancient Greek world. We call this area and era pre the prehistoric Aegean, uh, mainly because we're looking at cultures that are located on the Aegean Sea. It's also known as the Bronze Age. It's dominated by three cultures that existed between 3000 BCE and 1100 BCE. We will start with the Cycladic Islands here, which are a series of tiny islands out here in the middle of the Aegean Sea, the Minoans who existed here on the island of Crete, and the Mycenae who lived on mainland Greece. Looking at the location of these cultures, it probably comes as no surprise that they were a seafaring people, and they were also known as traders, and their location in the Aegean Sea gave them access to trade routes that went to the east, to Egypt, and also uh, to Greece and the mainland of Italy. Relative to the other ancient cultures we'll be studying, what we know about the ancient Aegean cultures has been discovered relatively recently. And the archeological um, studies go back really to the late 19th century. Two archeologists are responsible for discovering what we know. Heinrich Schleiman was interested in locating Troy and the um, Mycenae and Sir Arthur Evans was interested in finding the home of King Midas and the Palace of Canossus of the Minoan people in Crete. They were mainly driven by trying to find the sites and uh, the uh, stories that were mentioned in Homer's epic poems. We are fortunate that here in Richmond, we have a very fine example of art from the ancient Mediterranean world. And I'm showing you here a case that shows objects from the Bronze Age at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And it contains objects from uh, the Aegean period. First, objects from the Cycladic period, which runs from about 3000 to 1600 BCE. And we know very little about uh, these people in this culture, but we do have these really beautiful objects that they left behind. And I'll be talking about these figures, or we'll, we'll be looking at these figures. Um, and then we have the Minoan culture that runs from about 1900 to uh, 1375. And we know slightly more because, again, these um, cultures were mentioned by Homer and therefore were the goal of uh, 19th century archaeologists. They might have then been conquered and supplanted by the Mycenae, who existed between 1600 and 1100 BCE. And I invited Dr. Peter Schertz, the curator of ancient art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, to talk about these objects with us and give us a little bit of an introduction to the Bronze Age, but also tell us a bit about these fascinating objects that we can visit locally. So first of all, when we talk about the Bronze Age and art history, we generally mean the Greek Bronze Age. And it's a period that goes from plus minus 3000 BCE to about 1100, when Bronze Age civilizations collapse all across the Eastern Mediterranean. But it's important to remember that Bronze Age is a stage of cultural development. Many civilizations have gone through the Bronze Age, but at different periods. But again, we're talking about the lands of modern Greece and Western Turkey. So in this case, we have Greek material, or again, material that originates and lands that are now controlled by the modern nation state of Greece. And the earliest of those civilizations is called Cycladic. It's a circle of islands that um, are between Turkey and modern Turkey, modern Greece. 
and it's the stone objects that you see on the left-hand side of the case. So I think, yes, so we have a good picture of it. And these objects are incredibly beautiful. They helped inspire early modernists in the 20th century, and later modernists for that matter. It's like Brancusi, right? Like Brancusi. And there's a couple of quirky things about them. In almost every museum you go to, you will see them upright, like this figure here, vertically. And they're beautiful that way. You get to really appreciate the form, the elegance of the forms, the details of the objects. But the thing is, when you look at them closely, if you look at their feet, all of their feet are made at an angle. They are not made to be vertical. So, again, if you look at these two together, the one that's lying down, that's how they found her, found lying down. And the reason I did the case this way, no one in the audience and the casual visitors will appreciate it, but it may resonate with them on some level. It was an experiment to explore what happens when we reorient an object. What does it do to that object aesthetically? And there are theories that the human eye evolved in order to see things that are tall. Because, you know, grass, we evolved, come out of trees, we live in grasslands, anything taller than the grass is dangerous, anything shorter than the grass can't see us. <laughs> so there's a theory that our eye evolved to see the vertical. And to my mind, that vertical statue is more beautifully displayed than the one lying down, but the one lying down is being displayed more authentically to the nature of the object, and it's a tension that museums often have to deal with, true to the nature of the object, or create an engaging aesthetic experience for our audience. And, in, and if we look at the feet, it's obvious that it can't stand, right? Yeah, the feet are sort of like a ballet dancer on point. And just when you're made out of marble, that is not a stable position to be upright in. You know, we know they were not made to stand upright. And to, it's really important to remember that these things are made with the most primitive tools imaginable. You know, a lot of it's just hacking away. Bronze is not a strong metal. But it was the strongest metal they had at the time. It's hacking away with bronze and harder stones than marble, and then hand polishing everything. And with this figure, you can see some faint red stripes between the wrists, and we think that those are probably evidence of, of tattooing in the ancient world. They would have been painted? Um, they would have had, they do have pigments on them. Okay. Red is the most common because red is a pretty stable pigment made from ochre and it survives. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of other pigments sort of degenerate into a reddish brown mm -hmm. over the centuries. But yes, they would have been painted. Many of them are found in, in burials when they are found, and many others in temple contexts. So there may be a sense of fertility associated with them. Most, but not all, are female. There are other types, including musicians, um, flute players, and harp, you know, harp players, lyre players. But most of them are like the two examples in our, in our case. Okay, the next objects that I'd like to talk to you about, we don't have a lot from this culture, but it's a really fascinating and beautiful culture called the Minoans. The center of Minoan civilization is the island of Crete, and the civilization arises 2000, 1900 BCE, more or less. And it goes into a decline after about 1450, and they get replaced by another culture called the Mycenaeans at that point on, on Crete itself. The Minoans are fascinating. You've probably seen in textbooks or elsewhere these beautiful, colorful frescoes of bull leaping. Obviously, 
you know, no museum in America has a fresco of bull leaping. We have a little seal with a leaping bull on it that you can see in our case. It's very hard to see because this type of material is very hard to light and it's tiny. I'll be adding a, a, a detail so we can okay, see this. Great. And next to it, we have a much later coin from about 600 BCE, I think. And that coin comes from the island of Crete and it shows the maze because the most important later Greek myth about the Minoans and Crete is the myth of the Minotaur. Of course. You've probably seen in in Percy Jackson books or elsewhere, the half-human, half-bull. And again, what's fascinating about that is that the later Greeks still associated the bull with the island of Crete in that myth. And the bull itself, we're going to focus on a Mycenaean bull here, but the bull has been a really important object of cult as a symbol of fertility, also virility in the Eastern Mediterranean for thousands of years, going back to the Neolithic period. In fact, at a site in Turkey called Chateau Hoyuk, where they have the same church just filled with bull's horns. And because it's Neolithic, really nobody knows what to, how to interpret it, but that doesn't stop scholars from exercising their inventiveness and understanding who were these people and why are all the bull horns in it? Of course. <laughs> the last of the great Bronze Age civilizations in the Greek world are the Mycenaeans. They had a language that's a form of Greek. We know that because it's written down in something called Linear B script. And you should look up how that was decoded because it was the code breakers who had honed their teeth breaking the codes of the Nazis and Japanese during World War II, who after the war decided, let's figure out the script of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. That's fascinating. So the Minoan script is linear A, we still can't read it, but we've cracked linear B, they cracked linear B, I had nothing to do with it. Now the Mycenaeans, they're powerful warlike people, as far as we can tell. They are based on the Greek mainland. They later take spread to Crete and other areas. You can find Mycenaean objects in Egypt, in um, Judeo-Palestine, and Syria, all over because they were also traders like the Minoans. And one of being associated with the water, one of their beautiful motifs is the octopus. In your books, you probably have examples of the, Myce of the Minoan octopuses, which are much more elaborate and, um, you know, have more arms or kind of swirly. They're wonderful to look at. The Minoans sort of take that naturalistic view of an octopus and reduce it. They abstract the basic forms to these legs, the eyes, the beak, and concentrate on that. Many people take that as an indication that Minoan artisans weren't as skilled as the, Mino uh, the Mycenaean artisans, weren't as skilled as the Minoans. We don't actually know. They might have just had a different aesthetic sense and said, oh, we don't need all those whirly things. We just need to recognize this is an octopus. Um, that's always a big debate as you go through this course. You know, is it lack of skill? Or do the artists and their patrons have a different goal in mind? What are they trying to achieve and convey? 